Uh, we're going to go ahead uh, and start our next panel, which is uh, the education and the STEM advances. And uh, we have uh, two co-moderators for this panel, uh, Carl Deutsch and Bonnie Dunbar. Carl, uh, of course, has been here at the summit before. He has a, a great background, uh, not only in the space program, but also in education. He was with the uh, Canadian Space Agency and was instrumental in getting their Canadian astronaut program underway. Uh, he has served as president of the uh, International Astronautical uh, Federation and also was president of uh, International Space University. And Bonnie Dunbar, of course, uh, has flown five times in space, uh, great experience in flight, and uh, she has uh, served as uh, president of the Museum of Flight in Seattle and uh, came down to the University of Houston and became the director of their, their STEM center and uh, is now a professor at uh, Texas A&M University in the Aerospace Engineering Department. So let me turn it over to Bonnie and Carl. Well, thank you, George. Um, the way we're going to uh, manage this discussion is that I'll give a short introduction because we've been doing these education panels for years now and I thought I would update you. And then um, Bonnie uh, will actually uh, manage the panel. Uh, so that we finish in the, about the right time. So, you know, we've been speaking about education and outreach at least five, six years now at these various um, international space medicine summits. And I think uh, the reason that we keep on coming up for discussion is that education and outreach are essential for developing the feedstock for long-term space activity. We cannot leave it to chance that it will happen and support the long-term growth activity of space. And this has been recognized by the people who have initiated the programs, uh, space agencies in particular, since the earliest days the role of space as a stimulus for education and the need for education has been very pronounced. However, it's fluctuated. And I would say that somewhere around about 2013-14, we hit a low point in terms of the recognition of the importance of education for space amongst the agencies. This was tied in with what was, I think, almost an international move where the mandate for education was taken away from agencies and placed in education departments in those societies. And that was a setback. And I think it was recognized as a setback because education <laughs> agencies per se have a much broader mandate than to worry about whether space or informatics or some other technology or some other discipline um, is um, emphasized. And what we have noticed since that period is that slowly but surely agencies are coming back into the field. They're recognizing the importance um, of being active and the same is true of outreach. And of course, there's a whole lot of new tools which are available to do this. So let me kind of give you a couple of samples of how this um, global interest is um, growing again. I was at the International Astronautical Congress in Bremen um, three weeks ago. There were about 4,000 people registered in what I would call the core program, not associated with the um, exhibitions and things like that. Of those 4,000 people, 50% were either students or young professionals. Now, this is a real change over time. And not only were they attendees, but they were very active participants. They were beginning to drive the agenda. This, I think, was a very positive sign for the future. 
The second example I will give is Unispace Plus 50, where the United Nations space community got together and they said, we need to ground what we do in space along the same parameters that are measured on a global basis. And the parameter that has been going along since the Brundtland Commission back in the last um, century um, is sustainability. And this has evolved over a number of conferences, summits of the United Nations, to come up with a targeted set of areas of focus for society as a whole to maintain sustainability. And the effort at Unispace Plus 50 was to identify each of these target areas and to identify how space activity affected those target areas. As an outcome of this, a number of agencies are beginning to populate a matrix which shows how space is applicable and how it um, affects our life and our future life. Very important step, and it is a platform for the future, and education is one of those platforms. And at the same time, we're seeing much more cooperation between agencies in delivering the message. So that's the scene that I would like to set for where we have been going. Uh, tomorrow at the summary, we will add to this through the discussion panel, and there will be an update which uh, Bonnie should be giving. In the meantime, Bonnie's now going to seek out the new ideas, the new examples, and your ideas to allow us to really end up with a good discussion group. Thank you. Well, thank you. And normally at this uh, education panel, we... Uh, hear from uh, the subject matter experts in education. We hear about new ideas, new programs, status of programs. When we have our uh, team meetings uh, later today, we'll update uh, from actions of last year and try to add to the suite of opportunities for the future. And I agree with Carl. I think that we're starting to see some movement forward and some energy. Uh, part of that comes from visibility as well. Uh, the uh, excitement of going, of exploring beyond low Earth orbit and going back to the moon, I think, is helping to energize that. And we have a wealth, we're very lucky, we have a wealth of volunteers out there in the community, uh, retirees that want to participate, that would, are looking for programs to which they uh, can uh, align themselves with. So today we have a very distinguished panel. And uh, uh, we're going to use the same format. Uh, I'd like you've added a few new people, so we'll go down the table. If uh, you will give us your name and your current title, uh, and then uh, some comments on education or activities or thoughts or philosophies, whatever you think you'd might like to contribute to the discussion. And so I'd like to start uh, with my colleague uh, on this side, uh, to the, your far right, my my uh, my left. <laughs> uh, Steve Robinson, uh, who is, uh, has flown many times and is now a department chair at the University of California at Davis in Aerospace Engineering. Go ahead. Thank you, Bonnie, and thank you, Mr. Abbey, and everybody here. It's, uh, it's pretty neat to be on this side of the table on the educator panel after coming to this for so many years and listening, listening and being uh, inspired by folks at this table. And I always thought that it's not that education is an important part of the space program. I always considered the space program as an education program. That's what it's there for. And as an astronaut, you know, we often got sent to Capitol Hill to uh, speak to lawmakers, completely ineffectually, usually. And um, I remember one uh, very powerful senator saying, well, I will worry about the space program after I can get new roofs on the schools in my district so, so they don't leak which got me in a snarky mood. So I said, okay, that's good. That's a good priority. And after they're fixed, what will you teach in those schools if you don't have a space program? So I've always considered that the space program is an education program. Since So now having learning to be an educator for the last six years after 37 years at NASA has been an education for me, for sure. I've got a long way to go, but I just want to tell you a couple of things, lessons learned before I have to leave at three o'clock for my flight at five. Um, 
First of all, systems engineering is important to the space program in ways that many uh, uh, departments in academic uh, environments don't totally realize. It's not as fundamentally academic as many kinds of engineering, and yet if we send graduates out without a good idea of what system is engineering is, they have to learn it on the job in the aerospace world. That's not the place to start learning about that. Second of all, you know, it was, a, it was, a, it was an education for me. It was kind of a surprise for me, even though I knew it was this, this case. At NASA Johnson, the technical staff is about 50-50% men and women. So that gender mix became something that we were, well, first we were very proud of it, and then we sort of didn't notice it for a while, you know, because it, it, was, it was normalized. The number of women in my department, in the student population, is about 20%, and we brag about that. We think that's great. I think that's abysmal. It's just terrible. So what to do about it? Well, by the time students get to college, it's really too late. So we, we have started in, in just my lab, and this is a grassroots thing, from my research lab, an aerospace STEM for young women outreach program, where we go out to uh, fifth and sixth graders. And this isn't something that's funded by anybody. This is volunteer work by very motivated students, undergraduates and graduate students. And it's led by a PhD student who sometime, somehow finds the time to do this kind of thing. Um, I don't think this is gonna change the world and maybe change our demographics, but it is for sure changing these students who understand how important it is to not just be an engineer, but be a responsible member of society and try to make this change over the long term. The next kind of lesson learned um, that I want to mention is that internships, I think most of us know how important they are. I have, you know, I started NASA as a NASA intern in 1974, working on the, uh, the early space shuttle wind tunnel um, uh, tests at NASA Ames. So I kind of felt like that was the case. But as a NASA manager who hired plenty of engineers over my career, uh, I generally like to hire the people who had some work experience. So if you are a corporation and have room for, for, to make internships in aerospace, it counts so much. It's absolutely just the most important thing. And the final lessons learned, lesson learned that I'll mention totally surprised me, which is this. Students coming into college nowadays, um, it's very, very competitive to get into the good schools. And the students are very, very success. They're used to success. They have avoided any semblance of failure on their way to college. That does not make a good engineer. Good engineers have experienced failure have experienced things breaking and not working right. That's what engineering is, right? It's trying to get away with the least possible and still do it safely and within budget. So I have found that it's important to educate students about um, having the experience of things not going right. So I'm, I'm still in process on that. Thanks. Thank you. Linda. Okay, uh, my name's Linda Godwin. I uh, worked, I was down here for 30 years at the NASA Johnson Space Center, working for a while, actually the first five years in mission control and then in the astronaut office, many of my colleagues here. Always interested in education along with the job and I totally agree with what Steve said um, that NASA and education are almost intertwined. And now my current position is I'm a professor of physics and astronomy at the University of Missouri. And by the way, the, the way, the reason they took me back there, because it's not like I had 30 years of research here in publishing and grants, was because that's where I got my graduate degree. And so, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's always good to maintain your contacts, uh, you know, over the years, because you don't know when they're going to come in handy. So I have really appreciated getting to go back there, and I'm now into my eighth year, which I can hardly believe, um, teaching some classes there, and I've discovered that real full-time teaching is a lot of work. Um, but I've also learned a lot, and I was kind of, Nice to know I could still uh, do that, still learn. So I, you know, I wasn't sure what to say here today. I'm just going to talk a little bit about personally for me. Um, so I graduated from high school just to date myself with the Apollo guys who were earlier in 1970. So my whole, the whole 60s for me were watching the space program. And it was undoubtedly then maybe it was more of a passive education um, you know, stimulation, but it definitely was, because watching this, you know, from a small town in Missouri, it's like, wow, I mean, I don't know if I can do this. There was no path there in my mind, but 
I am sure I was one of you know thousands, if not you know multiples of that, of of kid, young kids who really got interested in science and math has to go along with that. Um, and there's no doubt. I mean, the story I've told over and over to the years when I've talked to students is that education is the key, you know, to things you didn't even know that those doors were going to be there. And that's what it became in my case. So I ended up um, at a smaller local state college getting my bachelor's in physics and then going to the University of Missouri and getting a PhD and then NASA started hiring women. And now that I had, you know, that was just fortuitous and finally, you know, something that had, um, it was time, you know, for it all to become more diverse, but again, that's what education prepares you for. And I think, you know, NASA is, is really a wonderful tool to uh, show students that this is how things can be applied. This is how technology can be applied, uh, you know, pure science, applied science, engineering, medicine, and I have just been really fascinated by a lot of the stories I've heard yesterday and today and things that we weren't even thinking about too much when I was here, particularly genetics related and all that. So anyway, after getting in the astronaut program, one of the jobs I cycled through a couple of times, I think it started in the late 80s, um, I was our astronaut office liaison to our newly formed education working group. And so we started out, uh, that was an effort really to say uh, a lot of people at NASA and certainly astronauts with all the outreach, there was always an educational component. But this was a more organized attempt to actually utilize astronauts' time, including on orbit, to make some tools that could be given to the educational community. A lot of it K through 12, maybe even more elementary and um, junior high kind of grades. But we started uh, you know, working on concepts, and these people would put to really talent. Uh, we had NASA people come down from headquarters. Back in those days, Frank Owens ran the education office. and really wonderful young woman named Pam Mountjoy worked there that became, was very involved in the teacher and space program um, from headquarters. But, you know, we, we had people here who were writers and would put together storyboards and they carved out time on orbit for us to start to put together, actually time to film these scenes and then they came back and they um, made them into really nice educational videos, of course, all on you know, uh, cassette tapes, because <laughs> that was the time. I think maybe they lasted long enough to get into some DVDs, I'm not sure. I know uh, Shep here was involved in some of those early ones too, and he shot one of those on orbit. But anyway, that was actually very good, and you know, I was aware a lot of those things were mailed out to teachers, and they had education guides. And you know, I just see what's happened now to today. I go look at NASA education side, and you know, with Space Station and people up there all the time, they've done some incredible um, educational uh, activities that now are downloadable and so we have all these resources that we need to make sure educators know are out there and we just had a year where we had two different very you know uh, talented and dedicated astronauts in space who are educators and I see that Ricky Arnold came here today and we should um, ask him some questions yeah. about all this Ricky in fact I think he's supposed to be on the panel so he finds a seat at the end <laughs> you, you should come on you down have mine I'm gonna leave it in five uh, minutes <laughs> You know, I, you know, I guess in the end, just to summarize it all, I'm just enthused about how we have continued to, you know, involve NASA in education. And now that I get to go back and talk to some students, and they're still interested in talking to me, even though most of these guys that I have in one of my larger classes were born about the time we started having humans 24-7 on space station, which is kind of incredible to me. Uh, but they're still interested in talking to me because they like, oh, NASA is just a hook, you know, in space flight and what were my experiences. And so I have an opportunity to weave some of those experiences into what I teach them in the classroom. And I am uh, just feel really privileged to get to do that. And, you know, when you work for NASA, we just, in general, the country likes NASA, so the door is open for us. And so this is a real educational opportunity all the time to, I think, bring this to the public. And, um, I've just enjoyed being a part of it now for more decades than I probably want to think about. Well, thank you. We've been, uh, it's actually been a, a, a really <coughs> rewarding experience for me, but I'm sure it is for you. We have astronauts that are going back into academia as yeah. well. So. And they let us do it. It's great. Yeah. So, Francisco. Uh, my name is uh, Francisco Fusco, and I'm actually a propulsion engineer currently working as test conductor for the Starliner um, service module of fire test, but I'm actually also the executive director of a foundation for international space education, which is a foundation that promotes STEM studies and uh, international collaboration. So I just want to share with you a couple of observations uh, monitoring the program that we're running. 
Uh, one is that, uh, you know, the lack of vision, uh, like a clear goal into the space business. The space, uh, you know, uh, seconding what Steve was saying, is very effective in education, and you can say that both ways, right? Uh, but the lack of vision is trickling down. So the students starting to get confused what actually we're supposed to do, right? And I'm uh, going back to the panels we had before. So Mars was very appealing, this, you know, uh, a offer uh, and, and a, a, a possibility, like you know, with a thin atmosphere, the presence of water, he offered the possibility to use local resources and looking at that settlement versus exploration you were talking uh, yesterday, Michael. Well, the moon cannot do that, right? So I, I'm sure we have a lot of, lear a lot of learning to do and technology on the moon, but, you know, um, we will have the largest vacuum chamber, right? I will put chamber A to shame. Uh, but you know, the concept that I hear like a moon village seems to me more like an exotic, exotic touristic place that actually doing research and work for a greater goal. So I think we need to get those priorities straight, what we intend to do and get that vision going. And it will trickle down also to, to the student. The other observation, um, you know, we've been listening to the, the Apollo crew <laughs> talking about is, uh, is regarding the modus operandi. So how are we going to accomplish those goals? And, uh, you know, listening to them is amazing. It's truly remarkable what they did, how they did it. Uh, but I don't think it's going to work today. I mean, the level of risk that we're taking, the com level of commitments they were having, you know, the spirit of sacrifice, like total dedication to the program, it's not there. The way that those students, that, that we are exposed to information today, the attention, sp attention span that they dedicate to a single issue is completely different. So I think we need to adapt and try to understand how to make it work. When now we're little, we're trying to do that because we observed with the time this change. You know, this program is, that I'm running is going on for more than 20 years now. So there's been major difference on how the students work, want to work, and how their interest is triggered. So I think it's great to see what has been done is a great uh, inspiration, but I think we need also to, to look with what we can do today. Yeah, I think we're all adapting to the new generations as well. So Mike, you've, you've uh, been in, in government and industry, and uh, you're now transitioned to the University of Illinois. So <laughs> what do you see? Thank you. I'm Michael Limbeck, and uh, as Bonnie said, I just recently left uh, the Houston community after about 11 years and moved back to Champaign-Urbana. Uh, some things haven't changed back there. It still gets cold in the winter, and the snow is getting ready to fall. Uh, we still enjoy seeing people from industry and from NASA coming. Uh, Kirk, I think you visited there earlier this year, and the students still talk about it. It's uh, really good to see folks from NASA come in. Uh, Scott Altman was just there a couple of weeks ago as our uh, homecoming chief. So uh, those are all good things. But a lot has changed in the 40 years since I went to school there. Uh, you can just see on Green Street, the uh, tallest building used to be about four stories tall. Now it's about 25 stories, and there are several buildings. And that's evidence of the international community that has come to Illinois. Uh, we now have an English campus in uh, China. Uh, students start there in a master's program, do their first semester there, and then come to our campus for two semesters to complete their degree. Uh, that's a lot of more international mixing that's going on than uh, was available uh, when, when I was there. I'm also seeing uh, a large increase, uh, as was mentioned, in terms of internships. Fully half of the 60 students in my senior design capstone course had an internship between junior and senior year, which is just fantastic. There was never those kinds of opportunities back in my day. Uh, there's a number of projects to work on, industry-sponsored and otherwise, where uh, students can really injure their grade point <laughs> and uh, have done so, and so we're looking for new ways to give them credit for working on these projects while still maintaining the grade points so they can pass the filters that industry have set to get jobs at the end of their academic career. We're seeing a proliferation of tools. Uh, back in my day, it was pencil and paper and maybe a calculator or a slide rule if you're lucky. Now there's a tool and probably 10 for just about everything you do. And as a result of that, the students are stuck sometimes in a garbage in, garbage out loop and uh, they've really lost, to, to my sense, the ability to problem solve. They're really great at doing analysis, but they don't know how to decompose a problem to take it down to its basic elements, to use the back of an envelope, if you will, to solve problems. And that's sort of what I'm trying to do now in my courses, is to give them that sort of flavor of how to get back into problem solving. Uh, social media has also become a big thing, and uh, I will not claim that I'm a social media giant, or, you know, in fact, I don't have Facebook or anything like that. 
but I don't have anything against it, but I see it as a negative for some of the student activities, particularly in student projects. Uh, we use a tool called Slack, which is like a bulletin board that the students use a lot of. And there's no face-to-face -face communication between the teams. Everything goes to Slack. And as a result, there's no personal responsibility to your team leadership. Uh, it's okay, I can go post my status up on a bulletin board, but I don't feel any need to go tell my program manager anything about it. So the programs that I've come across, we have five CubeSats, for inst instance, in a various flow uh, in our CubeSat lab. Uh, those CubeSats have had a lot of problems. And to solve those problems, I've gone back to an old-fashioned method. I got some butcher paper, I put a stretch of it in the wall, and I grabbed the students, I said, well, what are your tasks? And we laid it all out, and they could see the whole thing in 12 by 3 feet on the wall. And that's a lot different than looking at it on a small screen like your phone or a computer. And, uh, and I think today, as educators, we really need to help the students see the big picture, and that's what I'm trying to do at Illinois. Well, thank you very much. And I had a little stand at Illinois, so I remember Green Street with the short buildings, too. <laughs> So uh, I think I see Elena down there. Good afternoon. My name is Elena Fomina. And many of my friends who are in this room today know me as the uh, laboratory director for uh, hypergravitational disorders at the IBMP Institute of Moscow. And of course, my main uh, activity is to provide physical exercise program protocols for our cosmonauts and astronauts. And my other area of expertise is uh, 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 efficiency research for all kinds of physical training regimen. Also, uh, teach uh, space physiology at the uh, People's Friendship Institute, which is based in Moscow, and the students there uh, come uh, from all over the globe. And in, in doing all of this, at my department, I'm able to share my knowledge, and more often than not, that sharing capability has to do with the rehabilitation technologies and assets, because the uh, the suits that we use for training on board the station, uh, going back to the Mir station, uh, the Penguin suit, first and foremost, that we're currently also using on station. Uh, the resistive loading suit is what it is, that is currently being uh, very successfully used at a clinic for rehabilitation of uh, uh, stroke and cerebral palsy patients, and uh, the clinic that we interact with uh, has displayed a lot of interest in uh, getting familiarity with these technologies that originate in space. When, back in the day when we uh, drafted the lunar concept in the Institute, I tried to involve my students uh, that are far removed from these types of issues, and I tried to test them with, an, uh, with prepping a project that has something rather to do with, uh, with the moon, and I was so impressed beyond any measure with the uh, new solutions, new lines of thinking that these students uh, displayed, and uh, you know, working with our astronauts, uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to crisscross from the students and the astronauts, and being able to be here at the summit is obviously a privilege for me, and able to share and uh, hear other folks share their experience. So what I'm thinking about right now is that we need to have a broader approach in addressing the studentship. Because, uh, as I know, at the Vienna University, there's a uh, there's a lunar architecture course currently being uh, offered, uh, which took me aback, you know, when I learned about it. But then, you know, I started thinking, and I said, why would we want to limit ourselves to just medicine and engineering? We're going to get there, and we need to start thinking now, here and now about uh, lunar villages, and if we are, then the newer generation that will live in that era, why don't let them start thinking and uh, imagining and implementing some of the ideas, so a broader approach uh, to the issues that we've been dealing with for the longest time and uh, talking in medical departments about for uh, ever, and so trying to expose a broader body of uh, students to that, that's basically everything I had to say for intro words. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And uh, space architecture is also dear to my heart. Uh, the University of Houston uh, Sasakawa International Center for Space Architecture, and I think uh, Olga Bonova is up there as the director. They also find uh, that it's an exciting and interesting way of galvanizing uh, interdisciplinary education. 
Uh, well, next, uh, Salajan Sharapov is actually a former crewmate of mine. Uh, we trained together and flew together uh, to uh, Mir, and he's now uh, running a, a prog- educational program at Star City. And I actually remember having a discussion, and he may not remember this, very early on in Houston about what inspired us uh, to space. And I think it had both occurred at a very young age, but in very different parts of the planet, myself in a rural area of Washington State, and I think you in a very rural area near Uzbekistan or something, both looking up at the sky. So now he's come uh, full circle. I, and I, I like to joke that I was on a horse and you were maybe on a camel or something, but I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, in any case, uh, please tell us about your program. I'm so happy to be here as well and uh, to have this opportunity to share a word or two about uh, training high school students and uh, university students in our program. And the most important thing about what we do, uh, if you ask me, is uh, state support and federal funding. Back in the Soviet era, uh, it was great. Not a single problem at school level, university level, or elsewhere. Uh, All the subjects, especially astronomy, uh, technical and engineering uh, courses, uh, were an area of uh, focus. And then we take, you know, go into the early 2000s, and uh, that kind of faded, that tendency faded, and just recently, the state uh, felt that it's uh, losing the grip on the uh, younger generations, and uh, and then we have a. Uh, a, stu- a state-funded, state-sponsored program about uh, dedicated to drafting the younger generations in the technical engineering uh, areas. So let me tell you about what is currently being done. Not what I would like to see happen, but I would like to say a few words, if I may, about what's actually happening in Russia right now. There's a large body of financing that's dedicated to everything youth-oriented, especially high school students. All the uh, necessary conditions are being put in place in order for the uh, youngins to be able to, uh, no matter where they live outside of Russia or domestically, to be able to uh, uh, touch base with the uh, most recent and current uh, achievements in engineering and technical subjects. So new departments are being opened left and right, uh, regionally, municipally, new camps are being created as we speak. Uh, The Sirius uh, Youth Center uh, was put in place in the city of Sochi. It's a uh, year-round program and uh, no matter where you live as a high school student, anywhere in Russia or beyond, you are able to uh, apply and get admitted to the Sirius camp. Uh, highly trained specialists uh, in all kinds of science and technology related areas uh, get involved as a, as teachers and professors. All kinds of new programs are being created and the, the young generation is exposed to the experience of the generations that came before them and are able to kind of uh, get a grip on what's coming. And all of that in a very practical uh, sense, to uh, have a chance to study what they may become interested in and then to be able to have a practical uh, hands-on approach on that as well. Speaking of space specifically, we have a 20-day course and uh, all of the Roscosmos sponsors, all of the enterprises that are part of the Russian Space Agency are able to bring their specialists there. And when they come, they bring uh, examples of their hardware and uh, newest technologies that is being used in practical applications. And so uh, the younger folks get a get a chance to uh, meet with those specialists, and then they they get broken into different. Uh, uh, focused groups and then they start developing uh, their projects once developed get assessed and uh, ultimately ultimately you know we select the best of those groups and then they uh, have a chance to apply to the best of universities uh, nationwide that's as far as the space program is concerned then we have a robotics biotechnology uh, you name it, we have it. <laughs> and so 
Every year we have uh, over a thousand high school students that have a chance to uh, come to the Sirius camp and uh, are able to uh, bask in the sun on the beach while they're studying and all of that is completely uh, free for them. And so based off of that experience, Roscosmos has started uh, paying a lot more attention to uh, involving uh, younger generations in the uh, activity that is the bear, you know, the, the meat of what we do at Roscosmos. And so there are all kinds of uh, expos that are being thrown together in a variety of cities. We have cosmonauts, uh, all kinds of specialists that come and uh, interact with the students and are able to tell them what is, exactly they do back home. And also at the uh, cosmonaut training facility at Star City, we do have a young oriented space center training facility, which is what I do and what I supervise. What we do there is uh, we try to orient the uh, younger generations into uh, the areas of expertise that will become their profession later. So it's a very much a hands-on approach. They are able to come to our training facility and see where our cosmonauts and astronauts train. The centrifugal uh, assets, the uh, hydro lab, you know, they're able to see all that, touch all that, uh, touch base uh, and reach out to uh, the trainers and kind of get a grasp on what the station is and what it's composed of, different systems, subsystems, assemblies, and to, uh, to be able to actually sit in on uh, lectures that uh, are associated, uh, material sciences, medicine, biomedicine, uh, you name it, they're able to uh, sit in on that. Space navigation, you know, first aid and uh, emergency mitigation. And so with all of that in mind, uh, at our youth uh, training center, based on the Mir station uh, trainer, what we used for 15 years plus to train cosmonauts and astronauts, all of that has by now been uh, handed over to uh, support the interest of the students, high school students, university students, uh, and so on and so forth. And so in that sense, the, the, you know, the young folks are able to examine and study and learn the station, what it's like, how it's put together, what it's like on the exterior and the interior. They're able to uh, kind of get a grasp of what it is you do as a cosmonaut inside the station, what systems you support, and how the systems support you. Also that uh, Space Center, we have uh, a trainer a plane slash uh, helo trainer facility that's uh, highly adaptable and configurable. So their very first uh, contact with the aerodynamics happens in a very practical hands-on approach. And they get a chance to, uh, starting in grade six, by the way, you know, uh, think about a 12 or 13 year old uh, guy or girl being able to uh, try to operate a Boeing 747. We do have that trainer available on that uh, rig. We have the Mi-8 uh, helicopter trainer as well. Ascent, uh, fly around, and descent and landing with all the navigation uh, assets um, simulated and accessible by the uh, trainee. So I would say that the pilots train in the same way. Uh, in the same breath, of, uh, except we don't have the dynamic uh, ops, but visually wise and otherwise, you, it's just like you're a pilot uh, learning how to operate your craft. And we have also a uh, multifunctional uh, uh, training rooms, large screens, three by six meters, uh, that are used for uh, classes, lessons, also quiz shows, all kinds of educational and uh, outreach events, and so on and so forth. We have large auditoriums where our students uh, get up on the stage and uh, are able to uh, uh, give their presentations 
after hearing uh, the older folks giving theirs. And so basically, the larger the exposure, the better, so that the, the, the kids are able to uh, select their path, you know, what to commit yourself to and uh, what sort of uh, activity to pursue, be it medicine or engineering construction or it could be any number of things so it's an exciting program uh, uh, it's a good program and uh, it has uh, garnered a lot of interest nationally and internationally giving you some numbers over 10,000 students uh, went through our program just last year alone mm -hmm. not talking about tours or uh, any kind of uh, tourist related activity or any other folks that may come to the center for whatever other purposes talking students per se and uh, you know our history as i said the the uh, manned spaceflight history per se and everything that has to do with uh, high tech in that sense uh, bears a lot of importance to uh, the younger generations because if the young ones don't know their history if they uh, if they're not interested in and excited in get, getting information about what it used to be like and what it should be like in the future, then they won't have the uh, that capability to uh, take that uh, much-needed step into the future. So uh, history is something we definitely uh, pay a lot of attention to. So in other words, to make sure that no matter what we do, you know, we get the younger generation involved, engaged, and uh, also would like to say that we have a two-day, three-day, seven-day programs. <laughs> Or against, you know, uh, at the GCTC facility, uh, we have uh, students coming from as far back as, uh, as far as uh, UK, France, the very uh, real programs, and uh, it's happening as we speak, and we're doing it, uh, and we have been doing it for some time. And so, uh, if we have some students from the USA uh, come to visit us, we'll be more than happy to host them and train them. Very impressive set of uh, programs, and uh, uh, really, uh, uh, I see the growth of what's happening at uh, at uh, Star City. And for those of you that uh, didn't have the headsets on, uh, it's quite impressive what they're trying to do in in Russia and the growth in their programs and utilization of their facilities. So thank you very much, Saljan. And then uh, I think that it is it Isabel down there. Yeah. So Isabel uh, Tremblay, uh, who is the um, a director of Astronaut Life Sciences and Space Medicine, please. So, um, good afternoon all, and thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, to participate to, uh, to this panel and represent uh, Canada and uh, my uh, colleagues from the Canadian Space Agency who work hard on uh, STEM and outreach and education. Um, so I will represent as best as I can uh, all the activities that uh, we do at the Canadian Space Agency. So th there was a significant reduction around 2012 of our activities, so resources were really scarce. But since then, we're resuming uh, in, in a very important way our activities in, in the area. Um, in particular also because this government puts a priority on uh, education and, and STEM, our Canadian government. Um, the Canadian Space Agency is under the um, Innovation, Science and Economic Development Department. Um, and uh, in 2017, in the budget, the government proposed Canada's Innovation and Skill Plan. And this plan really focuses on, on people. And it's meant to address the changing nature of the economy and more emphasis on innovation and how we can prepare for that. So uh, obviously, uh, space is, is a powerful catalyst to inspire uh, widespread interest in science and technology. And, for the next generation uh, of STEM talent. So, of course, uh, what we do at Canadian Space Agency and the bold goals uh, set by our space exploration programs uh, inspire, and, and we can use them. Uh, they captivate the, imagin the imagination of the public and youth, um, they mobilize our ingenuity, and they drive innovation. So th this context really is favorable, and um, so this, this is why over the past two, three years, uh, there's been renewed efforts uh, at the CSA in education and outreach initiatives that really leverage space to uh, advance STEM engagement. And really, this has two uh, main objectives. Um, we want to inspire and encourage students to pursue STEM subjects and future careers. 
uh, but we, was, we also want to, to increase the potential uh, pool of highly qualified personnel from which uh, the CSC and industry can draw its workforce. So this will ensure future growth and, competitive, and competitiveness of, of the Canadian space sector. And as we do uh, and we lead those initiatives in, in outreach and STEM, uh, we, we see some, some important principles uh, emerge. Um, first, it's important to base what we do to have as much impact as possible on solid analytics and, and best practices. So data is really important. Uh, we can use social media now, we can get a lot of data about how effective uh, our different initiatives are, how they really engage the public, and we see uh, uh, particularly, uh, particularly strong interest for human exploration. So still astronauts and, and, and seeing other humans go to space. Flight to space is, is definitely still has a, an important impact. Um, we also see the importance of partnerships, whether they are partnerships across uh, uh, government departments are with international partners. So we've been working with ESA, we work with NASA as well, and I will give a few examples of the activities that, that we conduct. Um, it's important also to promote and demonstrate inclusiveness. Um, diversity is extremely important. It's, it's an essential condition to evolution, to innovation, and, and we use the data as well to have more impact into drawing diversity and to, um, into our activities and STEM. Um, we, of course, as I said, use data to make sure that uh, our initiatives uh, will have the desired impact and that we use our resources as effectively as possible. So, um, I will give a few examples of things we do, and they really span uh, span from uh, age ranges from uh, kindergarten to to uh, twelve uh, grade uh, to grade twelve, and uh, also undergraduate students. Uh, for un undergraduate students, we have a program at the Canadian Space Agency called Stedia. Uh, it's science, technology, and expertise development in academia. So. It, it supports colleges and universities to, pro provi uh, to provide opportunities for hands-on space experience. Um, and this is for students, post postdoctoral fellows, and, and professors as well. So really hands-on experience. And uh, my colleagues also underline the importance of having this really tangible and concrete experience and how it can be important. Uh, one example of initiative is, is the, Cube, the Canadian CubeSat uh, project. Uh, this project is providing professors and post-secondary institutions an opportunity to engage their students in a real space mission. So they will build real CubeSats. And, and the objectives of this project are, are very clear. It's to increase students' interest in STEM, particularly in space domains, uh, develop the students' expertise in, in space domains, uh, give students hands-on experience to prepare them to enter uh, the job market and for the studies as well and to advance space and technology at the same time because they can come up with great ideas, of course. So uh, it's a national initiative and we have participants that were selected in the various provinces and territories across uh, Canada. And their CubeSats will be deployed from the International Space Station in 2021. 20, uh, uh, we also have uh, activities that uh, offer open participation to the public. Um, most of the, uh, for example, recently we worked with NASA on the NASA Space Apps Challenge. So we had a big hackathon uh, in Canada and over 425 Canadians participated. Um, and uh, of course we have a Canadian uh, going to space very soon, David Saint-Jacques, uh, for a long duration mission on the uh, International Space Station and we are already deploying uh, activities um, for students uh, across the country, in the classrooms. Uh, there is the Little Inventors, uh, where uh, we partnered with National Sciences and Engineering Research Council in Canada to challenge its children across the country uh, uh, to come up with ideas um, that could be developed into inventions. And we had 2,000 entries <laughs> for uh, uh, submissions for that. Um, there is uh, another initiative, Living in Space, that explores how environmental conditions influence 
mental and physical health um, and to identify the best conditions for healthy and effective living. So we have different uh, activities like that in relation with David St. Jacques mission that are already being deployed before the flight and will also uh, be pursued through, uh, throughout this mission to engage uh, the public and the students in uh, space activities. Well, that sounds great. I, I don't want to uh, go too short for questions, but I want to make sure that uh, uh, Andy and uh, Ricky and uh, uh, Kevin have a few moments to talk about their programs. So, Andy, we talk about the Association of Space Explorers sure. Education. And, and I will promise to keep it short. Um, Association of Space Explorers, as hopefully at least some of you know, is an international professional association of flown astronauts and cosmonauts. So we have uh, approximately 80% of the people who have ever flown into Earth orbit are members or, or have been members of, of the Association of Space Explorers. I'll note that we have two former presidents of ASC in the room, Bonnie standing at the podium, who, whose term as president of the International Association uh, concluded at our recent Congress in Minsk, and also Soichi Noguchi, who's sitting over here, who was president of ASC just prior to Bonnie. And thank you both for uh, your service to the organization. Every astronaut in this room is a member of ASC, with the exception of one, and I see you hiding back there, Dave, but I'll, I'll catch up with you after the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so ASC, as mentioned, is a global organization. Uh, STEM is not our core competency, but certainly we try to play a role where we can. We try to have an impact where we can. Um, the organization is formed into regions, uh, United States, Europe, Russia, Asia, and each of the regions is, is organized and administered by a local secretariat, an astronaut board of directors who basically they design and execute their own educational programs under the auspices of our International Executive Committee. Um, here in the United States, we offer scholarships to undergraduate aerospace engineering students at several universities, uh, not as many as we would like, but again, you know, funding and resources are limited, so we have to pick where we, uh, where we have the greatest impact, and we have invited our astronaut members to nominate universities, either their alma maters or uh, just a university that they're associated with, to. Uh, engage with them to provide these kinds of scholarships for undergraduate uh, aerospace engineers. We do a lot of school visits. Um, the astronaut office at Johnson Space Center refers most of their overflow to us and it, at this stage of the game with the very small number of active astronauts and the unlimited number of, of, of requests that are coming in from schools around the country, uh, the overflow is huge. Um, and unfortunately the the, the ratio, the, former popu the population of former astronauts isn't so large that we can support uh, many of those, but we do what we can to get astronauts out into schools uh, to talk about what we're doing in space and what we're going to be doing in the future in space. Um, the Europeans offer scholarships at the International Space University in Strasbourg for the Summer Space Studies Program, and they also offer a monetary award uh, for the best human space flight related thesis of that master's program there. Probably our, our biggest impact that we have um, each year is at our annual congress. So each year uh, the astronauts and cosmonauts get together. Uh, they come from all over the world to one city. Uh, hopefully it's one city, sometimes it's more than one. Uh, where they'll spend a week talking about uh, lessons learned uh, in operations, in life sciences, in medicine talking about what we're doing in space right now, again, what we've done in this space for the past 50 years, and what we're going to be doing in space as we move outward towards the moon and to Mars. One of the most, I think, salient uh, events of each of those weeks is what we call Community Day. And this is a day where we'll send astronauts and cosmonauts out in teams to visit schools all over the country where we happen to be having our Congress. Uh, recently in Minsk, we just got done with a congress in Minsk, Belarus, uh, about three weeks ago, and we sent, uh, there were about 80 astronauts and cosmonauts there from 17 different nations, and we sent them out in groups of ones and twos to o over 50 different venues across Minsk. We brought students in from outside of Minsk, from the regions, uh, to a central location where we could engage with them and the 80 of our flyers who were there in one day reached over 3,000 students. So uh, it has a lot of impact 
you know, at the time that we're there, and we try to follow up to make sure that we stay engaged with the local organizing committees and the folks who are building the structures that support uh, the educational programs, the STEM educational program in each of those countries. Next year, uh, we're going to have that Congress right here in Houston. Uh, we run a, a week, again, a series of technical program, technical sessions during the week. Those are open to the public and to students. I think, George, we're going to have one right here in this hall next year. Uh, so I encourage you to get here early because seating will be very limited. Um, on Community Day, uh, and Bonnie is actually the host of that Congress here in Houston. She hosted the Congress uh, in Seattle 2009. 2008. Hurricane Ike. It's, Hurricane Ike uh, prevented a lot of folks from making it from Houston up to Seattle for that. So we're going to give Bonnie a do-over and she's going to organize the Congress here in Houston next year. And on Community Day, we're going to send 60 teams of astronauts and cosmonauts. We're going to have 125 flyers from all over the world here uh, for that week. And we're going to send 60 teams of flyers out all over Texas. And uh, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about your plan for that day? Or? Uh, well, I think I will, I will actually defer a little bit because I really would like to get around the panel, but uh, encourage everyone to think about that. And, of course, uh, we have our uh, education group uh, meeting uh, right well, at the very end of the session, and we can talk about it tomorrow as well in the close-up. So, so Bonnie concluded my remarks. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, I expect you to come to the education uh, team meeting, too. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, Ricky Arnold uh, just concluded uh, his uh, ISS mission, 197 days, so you had sort of a global impact right, in education. <laughs> you want to give us a few remarks? Sure. Hello. It's uh, great to be home, and I appreciate the, uh, the invite on short notice. As you can imagine, I have a rather long to-do list waiting for me this weekend and probably for many weekends to go, but it's great to be here with you today. Um, the Year of Education Station uh, was an initiative uh, purely by, by Flight Manifest, Joe Acaba, who was also a former classroom teacher, and myself happened to fly back to back um, and spend uh, just about a year on the International Space Station. Um, during that time, we also had an additional USOS crew member, which made more time available for, for some education activities. We were able to support, I think, double the, roughly double the number of live downlinks to schools uh, all, or, all around the U.S. Um, and uh, ham radio uh, contacts all around the world. Um, we uh, tried to come up with um, video products that's are, which are still being released uh, to, pro to provide a direct connection to the, the engineering and science uh, required to keep humans alive and working on the International Space Station. A couple of those have been released already, one on water purification that Drew Foistel uh, did. Um, many more to come on power. Um, the uh, what, what does it take to do a spacewalk? What, what are all the requirements to, to um, for life support? Uh, those will be coming out uh, probably over the next few months. Um, my hope was that uh, it, it's an opportunity for us not only to 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 show the the students make a direct connection to students about what, what the engineering that's required uh, and the science that we're doing, uh, to, and also to develop uh, STEM literacy uh, for those who for those who are following along with our missions. Um, Additionally, we completed uh, four of the, uh, of the lessons that were supposed to be taught on the Challenger mission. I think the first one of those has been released, but there's a couple more that'll be coming out, and those will be available for classroom teachers uh, to use um, as they see fit and as they fit into the school curriculum requirements. Um, my hope is that uh, we showed what a wonderful platform, uh, as many other astronauts before us that have, that the, what a wonderful platform for education the International Space Station is. Um, and, and in my mind, um, any conversation of utilization of the International Space Station should include a, an education component. Uh, I, I would imagine there aren't many, uh, my observation of polit politicians is such that uh, there aren't many things that people agree on, but I don't know that any politician would ever be upset with the fact that uh, their kids or their students and teachers were utilizing the ISS to improve STEM instruction in their communities. And um, so my hope is that we'll continue having that conversation and, and look for ways to uh, open up the International Space Station more for education. I would encourage you to continue to open up your doors in, of the universities, laboratories, um, private business, and NASA field centers 
to provide these very real experiences for students and, uh, and more importantly, develop teacher leaders in STEM, particularly those in the elementary and uh, middle school, the elementary middle school level. That's where the bottleneck occurs. The kids might not understand at that age what they want to do, but they can sure figure out what they don't like. And um, the more we can expose them to the, the, dynamic, um, the dynamic reality of what science, technology, engineering, math can be for a career, uh, I think uh, the easier jobs at the university level will become because you're going to have a lot of kids entering uh, fired up for, uh, for jobs in these fields. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Kevin, why don't you come sit up here and you just give a couple remarks and then, then George, if it's okay with you, we'll take a couple questions. Go ahead, Kevin. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll be quite quick. So um, I'm Kevin Fong. I run an undergraduate course at University College London in Extreme Environment Physiology. It's kind of the first of its kind, I guess, in our country. I also now serve as a scientist in residence at a local school, and that school partners with a lot of the less well-privileged schools in London. Uh, and again, we broadly science, but a lot of space is used in that content. And I do a fair bit of broadcasting. So public engagement and outreach has become a core part of my role. Um, this is, I think, much more important than most people give it credit for. And I know that my colleagues on the panel believe that it's important. But what we're talking about at heart really is change in behavior, change in attitude through these efforts. And that's increasingly difficult to do. I am funded in part by an organization called the Wellcome Trust, uh, who give away about a billion dollars a year for medical research. They hired me a, a few years ago because they realized they spent about a billion dollars on medical research, but no money on trying to convince, to tell people why we did it or how we should be doing it. They did gather some evidence um, about how we change people's opinions. They see the current climate partly as an existential threat for medicine because, of course, the war against disease is one at the level of public health and convincing the public to adopt certain behaviors, whether that is to uh, subscribe to vaccination programs or have different lifestyles. Um, and they see the current era as a time in which it's more difficult than ever to convince people that those are the right things to do um, the evidence that they gathered on that front was that the evidence doesn't work, that it's no good telling people that we've done some research and we have some evidence, and so that's the truth. People aren't convinced by evidence. And so actually, even for those of you who are in the room who are scientists, this is important because the evidence that you produce does not convince people. What convinces people is how they feel, and and and. This, ex th this is partly responsible for a number of things that are societal trends at this time. But you can't ignore that. And so uh, human spaceflight is uniquely advantaged because it is a technical subject in which has core embedded science but has a human story which encourages people to feel something. You've seen that through this conference. The stories that we've heard have made us all feel something. Uh, and that is, uh, that, is, that is a very useful tool in, in our efforts to try and alter behaviors in the, in the longer term. The final thing I'd, I, I'd like to say really is that we're in a new era when it comes to public engagement. Um, BBC, who I work for occasionally, have gathered some data. Uh, the terrestrial channels, the average age of BBC Two, BBC One is respectively 63 and 62 is the average viewership. It's creeping up. Uh, they're worried. Uh, they don't know what to do about it. Uh, it's very clear that the through coming generation do not consume media the way that anybody in this room did when they were growing up. And so if we're serious about engaging the public, we need to get across a lot of stuff that is pretty unfamiliar. And actually, as soon as you've got across it, um, there'll be something else coming along. Stuff moves much faster than we, <coughs> we're used to. So in summary, these efforts in public engagement, outreach and education are essential. Uh, they are what provides and ensures the future of our programs of exploration. They require us to alter people's behavior, but we don't do that by presenting them with evidence that tells them it's good for them. We do that by making them feel something about these efforts. That Then it's our responsibility to be part of these programs uh, and to engage as well as we can, wherever we can, however we can, and to embrace the full spectrum of tools that are currently available, which means, unfortunately, a lot of um, us learning new tricks 
uh, and then having to learn them all again. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Kevin. It's a wonderful panel. I kind of summarize uh, uh, something my father used to tell me because I'm, you know, just a farm ranch girl at heart. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And uh, what we are in the business of is inspiring, too. As, uh, they may not always know why they're learning algebra, but I remember that I was told if I wanted to go to space, I had to learn it. It was a great inspirational tool. So uh, with that, I'd like to open it up to a few questions. Uh, uh, first in the back, back there. Oh, okay, go ahead. I'm from China, so I have a poor English. Uh, last six months, we discussed with an American partner and a Russia and a French partner. We want to set up a new university in uh, the yeah, International Space University in Hainan. Three reasons. First, history. Uh, 2,000 years ago, in the Chinese people were very interested in studying uh, space technology. Second reason is about the international. The so last time we discussed with uh, IAA leaders in uh, Germany in the international conference. So now, in, uh, don't only American, China, Russia uh, study in, uh, space technology, but IAA is a member of from in uh, 89 countries. So another figure is in the uh, last time we discussed with uh, NASA export. Now, don't only uh, 600 uh, astronauts, but uh, now in the more 10,000 people very interested to go to the space. Maybe after five or 10 years, maybe 100,000 people very interested to go to the space. So maybe we are set up a new university, International Space University, don't only generate in uh, maybe uh, 10 college uh, engineer, financial, and uh, maybe we set them uh, in uh, space medicine college and uh, other China as a college. Don't only train 100 in the uh, trying to maybe 10,000 as trying to training in the university. Third, I bought in the, in the, I bought in the medicine. So the space technology is uh, medicine is very important. We have two questions. First, everyone may be an uh, expert, maybe a uh, welcome come high nine, come maybe a new uh, university, be a teacher in the student. Second, if you have some suggestion, your expert give a suggestion. Tomorrow, we will discuss in the uh, uh, un, uh, university with uh, Rice President uh, David. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I will tell you that we did have the 2014 ASE Congress in Beijing, and uh, we had a community day there. We saw quite a bit of interest on the part of the Chinese students in space. So, go ahead. Kevin made a very... Kevin made a very, very important point. With using words like story and feeling, it's really about engagement, I think. And we, we get subsumed by the word education, which is very important related to engagement. But I think we miss an important opportunity, an important way to communicate with others and ourselves in shaping what we do, to use engagement as our real objective here. That is the key to all of this, in my mind. That's right. Make it exciting and inspiring. Got another question for our audience? Yeah, I also... From our audience? I can't see because of the bright light. I also want to build on what uh, Kevin said, and, and that's that it's about feelings. And I, I'd like the panelists to sort of try and tie together some of what we heard of the last few days, what Walt said about the attitude of society today, what Michael raised about um, a trend he notices in his students and, and the lack of uh, problem-solving skills. What is it that we're supposed to be making students feel through space exploration? Because I think if you try and sell space exploration to politicians, that's a different audience, different message. And there are things like, you know, if you study STEM, it'll lead to jobs and high income and blah, blah, blah. But that's not what I think the message is to students. Who would like to answer that? Well, I'll take a stab at it. Okay, go ahead. Um, Walt Cunningham isn't here, is he? <laughs> um, today, there's a number of problems, I think, that we can see from space, you know, in terms of the climate, in terms of, uh, you know, other issues. And so for me, you know, getting the students engaged is how do you get past that wall of the social media stuff that they're using? Um, <clears throat> the way I found out the, w was the easiest way to do it was to spend a couple of all-nighters with them in the CubeSat lab. All the other professors and PIs disappeared and I hung out with them and you know you have some conversations and you start talking about why are we doing this? What's the importance of this? 
Uh, you know, we're helping people's careers out in terms of the research they're doing, but we're also bringing new knowledge to the general public to make our lives better here on Earth. And I think that's the real reason we, we do this. Well, thank you. I'm going to have to adjourn in the interest of time in the next session, but I'd like us all to think about our part in education. I always encourage everyone that uh, you need to be producing two other people like you uh, before you pass on. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, we'll go ahead and get the next panel underway. Uh, Richard?